Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. I'm Eddie, your host, and you're watching The Dean Show. My next guest, who's going to be with us in a second, to talk about why, when he accepted the truth, he ended up losing not only his wife, but his house, his guest house, and much more. He's going to be sharing his experiences with us, so you all can take the good from it, and it can help you endure some of the tests and trials that you might be going through. You don't want to go nowhere. We'll be right back to talk with our brother, Dr. Lawrence Brown. We'll be right back on The Dean Show. Allah, there's only one God, and Muhammad is his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. Allah, there's only one God and Jesus was his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. I don't know why I did that. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice. Assalamualaikum. How are you, Dr. Brown? Uh, very good. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Oh, sl slow down. You said something Arabic now. What'd you say? Uh, uh, Alhamdulillah. All praise be to Allah. Dr. Brown, our audience really enjoyed, we got some positive feedback on your show that we did on how you accepted this wonderful, beautiful way of life, the truth that is ordained from the creator of the heavens and the earth, that's practiced by over 1.5 billion people from all around the globe, the fastest growing way of life in the world today. People got to benefit from your story. How have you been since the last time we've seen you? Uh, again, alhamdulillah, no, every, things are good. Things are good. I'm keeping busy. I'm still writing. I'm still working. Uh, I guess in these days, that's a good thing. We really want to thank you, and I'm sure the audience wants to thank you also for coming back again here on Dean Show. I'm happy to be here. Okay, Dr. Brown. The world now knows that you, former military major, doctor, surgeon at that, has accepted this way of life, the truth, that all the messengers of God lived, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus Christ, and the last and final messenger sent to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They all live this way, the way that calls you to surrender your entire self to the Creator, the one God, in Arabic we call Him Allah, to surrender yourself to His will, to strive to be the best human being that you can be, to be in a constant state of self-development, self-improvement, doing all the good that he's called you to do, you've accepted that truth. But now there have been some hardships. Talk to us about some of these hardships that you had to go to, through and endure. Well, uh, actually, yesterday I was just at a conference where I was asked this question. Uh, I, I, I told my conversion story, and in the question and answer period, somebody asked, what, what happened after you converted? Was it easy? Was it hard? What happened? And uh, so I kind of went down this laundry list of difficulties because uh, I think it's the typical experience. When a person becomes Muslim, they face some difficulties. After I became Muslim, uh, within a period of one year, uh, my now ex-wife divorced me, took, uh, took my children into her custody, uh, took my house, wealth, and uh, I dare I say a certain amount of my happiness. Um, and uh, then at the same time, there there was just a a difficulty in the transition. So my fa my parents took it very hard. Uh, they they basically severed communication with with me and uh, disinherited me. And uh, I, I remember one particular communication where they just, they just told me by letter they didn't want to see me, they didn't want to hear from me, they didn't want a phone call, they didn't want a letter. They, 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 they basically just didn't want anything from me, any communication. At the same time, the, the people who I had hung out with before, my friends, basically deserted me. I was no longer the, the fun person in their minds that, uh, that I had been before. 
Uh, obviously, being Muslim, I wasn't into what they were into. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't into the, the uh, the drinking, the dancing, the partying, etc. Um, and that was a change for me. And so, so basically, they deserted me. Um, my job was no longer compatible with my faith. In the end, I. Uh, I had to leave. I was in the military. I, I was. Uh, I had been in the Air Force for. Uh, well, let's see now. It would have been 12 years at that point. Uh, I just signed up for another four years, and uh, and uh, so I found out during that period that really I I didn't feel that my faith was compatible with being in the military. <clears throat> I, I I effectively became a little bit. Of a of a pacifist, and here I was in this in this war machine that um, that I, I simply could not uh, reconcile with uh, with my faith. So to make a long story short, within a period of one year, I lost my parents, my friends, my wife, my children, my house, my wealth. Uh, I went from being a successful doctor. To still being a doctor, but in uh, in pretty straitened circumstances. Dr. Brown, should people who accept Islam expect these hardships? Someone might say, "Well, I'm coming to the truth. Why all the hardships?" Uh, yeah. First of all, I think you should accept expect some hardship. Whenever anybody comes to Islam, they need to expect some hardship, and I think that is the price of sincerity. It's the price and the proof. Of sincerity, look. If it were a party, everybody would be doing it. It's just like any of the other tests of sincerity in religion: prayer, fasting, paying charity, making pilgrimage. All of these things are things where you take from your time, from your wealth, from your energy, from other things you you can be doing to get down. Get down on your knees and into prostration and pray five times a day, to to take time off from eating and drinking to fast for the pleasure of our Creator, to uh, to pay from your wealth to benefit other people who who need it more, um, to make pilgrimage, taking taking your vacation time and your money to go and do something uh, for the pleasure of our Creator. Instead of going and hanging out on the French Riviera or some other kind of vacation, all of these, all of these things are things that you take from yourself as a testimony of your faith. Uh, like I said, if it was a party, everybody would be doing it. But for those who are seeking seeking Allah's reward in the Akhira, meaning the hereafter, uh, there's a there's how can I put it? A price to pay. Uh, some, something, something that you have to, you have to expect to put forward for for the uh, for the hereafter, and when you become when you become Muslim, it can be easy for most people. But one thing I've noticed is that, in general, in general, converts to the faith find themselves tested in the beginning. My own impression is that that is a test of sincerity. Because I've seen people, I've seen people pass that, and I've seen people fail that. I, I have seen converts to the religion go back to disbelief, because the tests they faced after they became Muslim were greater than they felt they could bear, and it was really sad. I mean, I've seen people go back from faith for, for piddly little things that you you would just you would just think, I mean, how could a person throw their faith away for that? Very sad, but so bottom line, yes. When you become Muslim, expect to be tested. Expect expect to have to show some some strength, show some patience, and and endure this test because because truly, anything that you leave for the pleasure of Allah, He will replace with something better. And and Allah tells us in the Holy Quran. In a malus riusra, after hardship comes ease. Uh, I just described my hardship, or a part of it. Uh, there was a lot more to it than that, because 
Uh, after I got over that hump, there, there were other hardships that came along. But as I said, I lost my wife. Allah gave me another wife. I remarried, and I have to say I am happier with my second wife than I ever was with my first. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I, uh, you know, I lost my children from my household, not from my heart. They're in my heart, and I hope that I'm in theirs. We, we still get together for vacation every year. We still see each other. But Allah gave me another child by, by my new wife. I lost my house in America. I now live in, a, in a, you know, a better situation in the holy city of Medina. Alhamdulillah. I lost my friends, some of my family. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me the family of Islam, which is worldwide. And which, I mean, I can honestly say, you never feel a brotherhood. You never, you never really know what brotherhood is until you're in the brotherhood of Islam. I have one brother, no sisters, just one brother. He also became Muslim. What I can tell you is he and I are constantly reminding each other of the fact that we were never brothers. We were never brothers until we became brothers in Islam. You know, we were fighting, we were at each other's throats, we saw each one, we saw the other one as somebody who kind of blocked our desires or, I mean, we were just at each other's throats until we became brothers in Islam. When we became brothers in Islam, then we knew what brotherhood really was. Um, I told you I, I lost my wealth. When I, when I became Muslim, I used to live in a uh, country, I don't know if you could really call it an estate, but I mean, it was a house on acreage out in the country. Um, I used to tell people, I didn't have a guest room in my house. If I had people visiting, I didn't have a guest room. I had a guest house. I had a second house on the property that was for guests. That's, the, that's how nice the layout was. And that's what I lost. I went from living in that circumstance to living in a pay-by-week studio apartment in just, I mean, a really bad area of town. Uh, you get, you, you know, you, 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 would, you, you didn't want to go into the elevator to go up to, to the floor because, you know, people were urinating in the elevator. But the stairs weren't any better. You, you take the stairs and you practically had to hold your nose because peop, you know, the people were urinating in the stairwells as well. It was that bad. As I said, you know, I mean, look, pay by the week, I mean, you know what pay by the week means in America. I mean, where do you, where do you, find, uh, where do you find a rental apartment that's paid by the week? All right, we're going to hold it right there. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back for more with Dr. Lawrence Brown here on The Dean Show. No speech is better than to do that, to call people to Allah and to do the work. No speech is better. No, nothing is better than that. Is it true that if one person and the Allah giving you the ability to guide someone with Allah's permission, the Creator's permission, that is better than everything in this world? Better than the whole world and everything that's in it, in, in another narration, it's better than the best of wealth. But if we really felt that, Eddie, would we not be give, out giving down? And this is something that we encourage all the MSAs, all the Dawah organizations, the masjids, to get this. We want to print more. We give these to the non-Muslims for free, for free, for free. We want our brothers in humanity to become our brothers in faith. And so even yourself, being in such a respected field as a doctor, you also endured a lot, huh? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's easy to look at somebody who is in a respected field, like as a doctor, who has a respected income and so on, and you don't think that they can fall too far. Uh, you know, but there's this old saying that what counts is not how far you fall, but how high you bounce. But, uh, but that doesn't mean you don't fall. I mean, uh, at that time, I, I was saddled with very he heavy lawyer expenses because of the divorce. Uh, you know, I had just received a restraining order from my wife telling me I couldn't go within, I forget, but it was something like 100 yards or 500 yards of of her, of my children, of my house, and so on and so forth. And this all because, you know, and all just for a no contest divorce. She had just gone in and said she wanted a divorce. And they said, what for? Is he beating you? Is he mistreating you? And they said, no. Oh, or she said, no. She said, uh, no, I just want out. And they said, well, what's he doing? And she said, nothing. Nothing. I just, I just want a divorce. That's all. So it wasn't... It wasn't like I had any history of being a violent person or, or doing anything bad. She just, 
she just went to the court and got a restraining order on me. Uh, I had to, to, to see my children. The court made me hire a security officer to protect my children from me, for me to see my children. When the court started to allow me to see my children, even though by my wife's own admission I was a peaceful person, I never, I never did anything to, to warrant a divorce, just she wanted out, she was Catholic, I had become Muslim, she just, she wanted out, that was enough. You weren't the cool guy anymore to take around to the social wine tasting parties. Huh? What could I say? I was no longer the, the fun guy. Uh, I, I, used to, uh, I used to brew my own beer before I became Muslim. Okay, look, I'm sorry to say, but yeah, I used to brew my own beer. One of the things after I became Muslim that my father complained about was that he missed my beer. Not me, my beer. Didn't say he missed me, said he missed my beer. Now, you know, it was a hard time. It was a bit of a crazy time. And, and you know, I wasn't the best example of a Muslim at that time. I don't, I don't blame my parents for, for their reaction because, because they saw me go from the person they knew to a person they really did not know or understand. And at the same time, with the media representation of Islam in the West, it creates a lot of fear and uncertainty in people's hearts. And when you see this happen to a loved one, whether it's your son, as was the case with my parents, or your husband, as was the case with my wife, it, you know, it bends people's minds. And it takes, it takes time for them to come to realize that you may have changed your religion, but you yourself may not have changed that much. Now, did you grow your hair in a funky way, start listening to rap music, get tattoos, would you dress different? I mean, what made you such an outcast to them? Uh, no, I, I, I didn't really dress differently, but, but it was just a, a series of things. You know, when you become Muslim, you clean up your act. You, 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 you know, you stop going to, uh, you know, you, you stop going to dances, parties, you stop associating with, uh, you know, with alcohol. I'm not saying you stop drinking. I'm saying you avoid places even where alcohol is dr drunk. Okay, but fruit juice, apple juice, pineapple, non-spiked is okay, huh? Well, of course. I mean, you, you know, so many other things that you know are are, are good for you, and and that, but but alcohol is out. So, uh, you know, you you stop going to social circles where alcohol is served. Uh, you. Um, you know, you're no longer that hug your neighbor kind of a guy, you know, because you, you don't you don't even shake hands with women anymore. You don't shake hands with your neighbor's wife. How about a kiss on the cheek, baby? <laughs> Look, you know, I know this is a shock to a predominantly Christian West, where you, you know you go to a wedding ceremony and you dance with the bride and you kiss the bride and you and uh, and uh, all other things. I mean, the garter belt scene and all this stuff. But look, look, the bottom line is we're talking Christian West. Christian. What does Christian mean? Follow the example of Christ. Show me anywhere in the Bible where Jesus Christ touched a member of the opposite sex outside of his family. Please show me that. It didn't happen. He was an Orthodox Jew. Orthodox Jews to this day do not, uh, do not touch women outside of their family. Or if you're a woman, they don't touch men outside of their family. I mean, we know this was his code of contact, conduct because w when we say Jesus, what do we sometimes say? Rabbi Jesus. He was an Orthodox Jew. This was a code of conduct that was respected throughout the Abrahamic faiths. It's only in modern times that our customs have bent it out of shape according to the desires of the people. Just one more note on that, Dr. Brown. Isn't this a high sense of respect given to the woman when in today's society men are trying to do whatever they can to grope up on a woman and get a cheap feel here and there. Where in Islam, we don't have a right to touch what's not ours. Some will get offended. Some people will get offended if you touch their car. I mean, women are more precious to us than our cars or any material goods. So isn't this a respect towards the woman and her husband, actually? Is it, is it an article of respect not to touch a woman? Yeah, it's an article of respect to her. It's an article of respect to her husband 
to respect that this woman is for this man, and you don't you don't uh, you know you don't uh, interject yourself into that in the least little bit. But look, don't ask me this question. Ask a woman this question. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the United States. It's the fastest growing religion in the world. And most of the converts to, to Islam, the majority of the converts to Islam, are women, not men. So, you know, we, we hear these popular sayings that Islam is a man's religion. If Islam is a man's religion, why are most of the people converting women, not men? It's because, it's because they see that the rules of Islam, instead of, instead of uh, constraining them, the rules set them free. Now, that's, that's difficult for people to understand, and it's best explained by a woman, but it is the fact. After hearing this jihad struggle, because jihad is what it means is to struggle, after hearing about this struggle that you went through, should people be worried about, scared about, accepting this truth? You know, what I can tell you is I don't, I don't regret anything. I wouldn't change anything. Um, I've been Muslim now for about 15 years. I can honestly say I never gave up anything for the pleasure of Allah except that He gave me what was better. And, you know, an important point is that with all of what I described that I went through, despite going through the divorce, losing my kids and my family, lose, losing my friends my, and my parents, and so on, uh, the problems at work, uh, the, the problems with the prejudice and everything else. The one thing I haven't told you is that during that period of time, when I was facing all those trials and tests, I remember that time as some of the best days in my life. All I can tell you is that Allah filled my heart with peace and satisfaction and showed me what was really of value. Showed me that this dunya, meaning the material aspects of this life, this dunya is, is nothing. It's nothing compared to living upon the path of truth, living upon the path of the religion of our Creator's design. When you, when you submit to Allah and you submit all of your actions to His pleasure, you find that he gives you a level of satisfaction that makes everything else seem insignificant. And over time, step by step, you find that things just come back to you. Um, as I said, I don't blame my, my ex-wife and my parents, not completely in any case, for what happened. Because they saw the change in me. They were suffering the concerns that they had from how, how the media portrays the Muslims. Um, and uh, and it, they couldn't think straight. They couldn't think straight in their circumstances. My wife was worried that, you know, I would abscond with the children. My, my parents thought were thinking the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, with time, they came to know me again. Uh, my parents and I are back on good terms. Uh, my ex-wife and I are you know, able to, to communicate in a, in a polite, respectful way. Uh, my children, as I said, they've always been, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've always been together by telephone and vacations every year. And, and, uh, and my life circumstance improved in so many different ways. One, th one thing I can just say from this experience is anybody out there, anybody out there who perceives the truth of Islam, and wants to embrace Islam, do not be afraid for a second. Do not be afraid of what you will lose. Do not be afraid of what you will face. Do not be afraid of the trials and the hardship. Just pray to Allah to make it easy for you, to give you patience, to give you strength to bear it, not to, not to test you beyond your ability to bear, and to bless you with abundance therein. Because I can just, I can guarantee you from my experience, from the experience of other converts I have known, I can just guarantee you that after you become Muslim, Allah will, will fill you with such a sense of internal richness that you will realize that everything that you valued before Islam was for nothing. Can you in short define for our non-Muslim audience, for our brothers in humanity who we want to become our brothers in faith, use some Arabic words, can you define for them Islam 
Muslims, Allah, what this means? Let's start with Allah. Allah is the name of the Creator. Um, if you go to the Holy Land, you will find that the Arab Jews, the Arab Christians, the Arab Muslims, they all refer to God as Allah. Um, this is the name that they knew our Creator by in the Holy Land. And remember, these are the people who, who are the descendants of the, the lineage of the prophets. Okay, They are the ones whose forefathers walked the earth in the company of the prophets. They should know. Uh, you look in the Bible and you find in the Old Testament that God is referred to as Eloh, E-L-O-A-H, Eloh. Now, does that sound more like God or does that sound more like Allah, Eloh? Um, he's also referred to as Elohim, which is the plural. Not the plural of numbers, but the plural of respect. Plural of respect being a literary device, a way of showing respect uh, through, uh, through words. Okay? So in any case, in the Bible, you find God called Eloh. I think it's 128 times. And 2,500 times, 2,500 times called Elohim, with an I am at the end. Again, what does that sound more like, God or Allah? So that's Allah. Um, Muslim is Mu'Islam, a person of Islam. Islam being to submit to, uh, to Allah. So a Muslim is a person who submits to, uh, to Allah. Before we part, can you please tell us about some of the books that you've authored? Well, there are five of them out, right, out there right now. Uh, the, uh, the, ma the main ones I recommend are a, a trilogy. The Eighth Scroll. The Eighth Scroll is an action adventure. Uh, it's been described as Indiana, Indiana Jones meets uh, the Da Vinci Code. Uh, and that's pretty much what it is. It's an action adventure set in America, England, the Holy Land. Uh, it concerns the theme of the Dead Sea Scrolls and a missing scroll, which uh, is so controversial that it threatens to upset the religious power base of the world. And uh, it's, all I can say is it's a fast-paced action thriller, and I think people will like it. That's the eighth scroll. Uh, for those who are more academically inclined, <clears throat> I have uh, Misguided and Godded. And these, these are books of uh, comparative religion. Misguided is entitled um, A Roadmap of Guidance and Misguidance Within the Abrahamic Religions. What that means is it basically tells which religions went right, which religions went wrong, why, and how, and shows how throughout time there has been a continuity in the chain of revelation. So the truth of the message was never lost. That leads to Godded, which argues the case for Islam as the completion of revelation. So for those who are interested, I would say start with, start with the Eighth Scroll if you want a fast-paced thriller an action-packed read, uh, something fun to kick back with and, and, uh, and sort of enter this discussion lightly. Start with Misguided if you want to, if you want to seriously engage the, uh, the issues of analyze, analyzing the Jewish, Christian, and, and uh, Islamic religions, and then move on to Godded. All of these are available through Amazon.com uh, and also through my websites. Brother Brown, Dr. Brown, thank you very much. May Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, reward you for being with us. And, and you. And thank you for, for inviting me once again to the Dean Show. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And that was our brother, Dr. Lawrence Brown. Thank you, brother, for being with us. And everyone who has taken the time to watch this now. I hope you got to benefit from his experiences. We're all going through tests. This life is a test. But what's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, or maybe a day, or two days after you watch this? Or maybe you can go outside right now and you might get hit by a car. You don't know. Death can sneak up on you at any time. So is it worth it that you live according to your whims and desires and you chase 
the dollar, that man, that woman, and you make that your main priority. You forget about your purpose in life, nor do you even ask. And I'm not talking about asking Joe, the car mechanic, or Trisha, the hairstylist. I'm talking about asking the one who created you, the one who created this whole universe and everything in it, the one who Jesus Christ called upon, the one who submitted himself, as all the prophets submitted themselves to God, including the last and final messenger sent to mankind to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They all called upon the one who was all-knowing, all-merciful, all-loving. They called upon him for guidance and direction, the Creator, the one God, in Arabic, Allah. So we call upon him and we ask him to help us and to guide us and to help us through the hard times and the struggles. We want to show that we're sincere. So we don't want to because, you know, we had a bad day or maybe something came along that we had to implement. The prayer might be getting in your way. No, 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 no. We revolve, revolve our life around Islam. We don't try to plug Islam in. So whoever you are out there, it's tough. It's not easy. Life is a challenge. With or without Islam, you're going to be going through hard times. But with Islam, being on the right direction, you got your Creator's help. And for every hardship that you go through, God Almighty will recompense you. He will take care of you. He will reward you. And you'll have that peace and tranquility as Dr. Brown did. You see, for someone else that might have went through this, People lose their houses and wives all the time for other things. But he went through this for his creator. And Allah replaced it with something better and gave him the strength to endure and the patience. And at the end, we have nothing less than paradise if we stick to this way. But what do you got if you go to the grave and you didn't live life according to how your creator wanted you to live? You lived it according to the society or culture that you live in. That might not be calling you to good, it might be calling you to evil. So we have to be striving to be the best that we can be according to God's will, not our desires. And take from this story and try to stick straight and strong to the right way, the right direction. This life is short, it's a test. All right, there ain't nothing to it but to do it. And we'll see you next time here on The Dean Show. Until then, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. He created the universe To Him belong the heavens and the earth The ever-living, He is the first He's the owner of mercy He sent His messengers To warn His creatures Of the grave dangers Of worship other than Allah There is none greater Than the Creator Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar No speech is better than to do that To call people to Allah and to do the work No speech is better No, nothing is better than that Is it true that if one person on the Allah giving you the ability to guide someone with Allah's permission, the Creator's permission, that is better than everything in this world? Better than the whole world and everything that's in it, in, in another narration, it's better than the best of wealth. But if we really felt that, Eddie, would we not be give, out giving dawah? And this is something that we encourage all the MSAs, all the dawah organizations, the masjids to get this. We want to print more. We give these to the non-Muslims for free, for free, for free. We want our brothers in humanity to become our brothers in faith.